Okay, thanks very much, David, for the introduction. Um, and um, thank you to our sponsors, to the NRN, for, for inviting us to come and give, the, give, this, uh, give this talk. Um, I would just say I have two, two provisos, health warnings on the talk. One, I haven't quite given the talk in this format before, so we'll see how it goes. Uh, it's new to me in this order and in this, in this emphasis. Um, and also, I've picked up a cold this week, so if I have a sneezing break in the middle, you, you know what's happening, okay? Um, and, 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 and speaking of sponsors, I, I would like to introduce right at the beginning a quite vested interest, I suppose, in the topic of the talk, in that we've just been able to secure some funding uh, through um, WEFO and uh, uh, um, structural funds to establish a, a new centre for shellfish science and innovation based in uh, the Marine Centre Wales building in Menai Bridge. Um, this is going to Gives us an opportunity to, to, as a kind of seed funding for the centre. Uh, it's quite a substantial award, uh, and it's going to be promoting collaborative research between scientists within Bank University, uh, and particularly in the shellfish production sector across Wales. So that's um, that's a, that's just started now. So that's that's a three-year programme that we're just setting up. Um, I mean, it is going in full circle. I'm, I'm mindful of some of the people in the audience. Those will remember. Um, the, uh, the fisheries laboratory in Conway, which was a, a centre for uh, shellfish research for many years. So maybe the wheel has turned and shellfish are back in fashion. So um, there we go. So actually what I'm going to do in this talk is I'm not going to get into too much technical detail. That, um, what I want to do at the beginning is just um, kind of interrogate this question a little bit about why we might need food for the sea. Uh, and then um, hopefully painlessly look at a few statistics as to, to, to where we are in terms of uh, achieving this. And I suppose the other thing I, I would ask at the beginning is, is are there, do we, are anybody in the room vegetarian or vegan? Don't worry, I'm not going to pick on you. It's not, a, it's not one of those questions. There we've got somebody, we've got a couple. I've been a vegan at times, right? You will have a completely different perspective on this and go, why are we eating, even eating animals if we can solve the world's food problems without that? However, that's not what goes on in, in most people's diets globally. So I think that's worth bearing in mind. There are different solutions to the same problems. And I mention that because this is the driver that tends to be put up for, for the need to increase food production. Um, and it's certainly a, a driver for increasing aquaculture, so farming of food from the sea. Um, and it's the classic... <coughs> historical and projected human population growth curve. Uh, we're, we're this, where are we? This must have been made in 1999. I didn't have the date there, but here we are. Uh, we've just hit about, what is it, about seven and a half billion. The clock's ticking, numbers are going up. So there are more mouths to feed, and there will be a projected, I'm not quite sure how they know it's going to taper off at the top, but mm -hmm. apparently we're going to reach an asymptotic situation and, and there'll be, there'll, the growth will stop. But, Projections that, that maybe in my lifetime and younger, younger, younger people present's lifetime will get up to 9 billion people on the planet. And so there is, there is an issue of food supply. And how you look at this question really depends on your kind of outlook. Are you um, the Cassandra type who says, there's a crisis coming, this can't be solved, it's terrible, what are you going to do? Are you more the Pollyanna type who says, well, we can fix this as long as we, we take the right strategy and, and find the right solutions? Um, and I suppose aquaculture falls into one of the kind of more Pollyanna-ish stories about, about how we're going to increase food production. And it does matter. This is, this is um, a slide taken from um, uh, an FAO report uh, which looks at the state of uh, fisheries and aquaculture production globally um, every few years. Um, don't worry about the detail in the, in the legend there. I think that the, the, the important bit to look at is wherever there's hatching, so cross lines over any of the countries on, on the picture. Um, and in, in, in those, those countries, uh, it should, that, that's where more than a quarter of uh, animal protein supply in people's diets uh, is provided by fish of some sort. So there are large parts of the world where fish or seafood production, and you'll see why I have to try to start differentiating those in a minute, are really important. It's also interesting that since 1950, per capita income of, of fish or seafoods has, has doubled. 
the current figure is about 14 kilograms per person per year, a global average. And that's expected to carry on increasing, and it's increasing perhaps up to about 20 kilos per person per year if supply will meet that demand. So um, there is a real demand to increase seafood production. And I think it's important um, to look at this also from a kind of a socioeconomic um, poverty alleviation point of view. There are many countries where um, aquatic food is really important for people in the poorest sections of society. Um, and many of those hatched areas on the previous slide would map over with countries in, in less developed uh, status um, and where, where rural communities may depend on, on seafood in one, way, one form or another um, or, or freshwater food, as um, fish production as well. And it's not just about protein. Remember that's, that seafood is an important source of central fatty acids and minerals as well. So it's nutritionally very important. So, um, how's, that, how's that demand going to be met? So, this is, this is slightly out of date. That the, this is more FAO data from the SOFIA report. This, this, is, this is four years out of date. This is normally, I think there's one from 2016, but it didn't have such a nice graph in it. This shows, um, in orange, that since 1950, uh, the uh, trend in capture fisheries production. So, this is fish uh, and other fisheries products removed from the sea wild capture um, and it's pretty clear if you look at the orange section of the graph that, that since, since the late 1980s uh, that's pretty much um, flatlined and has stayed stable at somewhere between 80 and 90 million metric tonnes a year um, and the best we can hope for is that it will probably stabilise at that level. We're still in a situation where something like 30% of global fisheries are over exploited uh, so there is a risk that this, this number may even drop. But the blue section is um, food that's been seafood or aquatic food that's been produced by aquaculture or farming. And that's increased, so if you add the two together, we've got a pretty good linear uh, increase in uh, aquatic food supply over the last um, 60, 70 years. I suppose an interesting question, though, is, is what's that made up of? Because one of the reasons I was prompted to start the talk like this was a headline in the, in the, in the news. It was in The Guardian, I think, when I saw it, but it was in various other out, uh, media outlets, where they would say, well, aquaculture is now producing half of, half of all seafood that we consume. And this is slightly out of date, so by 2018, that will still have been growing, and that statistic on this metric is probably about right. So, how true is that, I guess, was the question that, 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 that I was thinking of. So if you go into, dig into the same report, they break down what it is that um, has been uh, produced to make up those numbers. Um, and... Uh, don't worry, there's only two or three graphs in the, in the whole talk. But this is, this, is, um, this is quite telling. So what have we got in here? We've got um, freshwater fish at the top, uh, and then everything else below that is, is marine, so grown in, in brackish water in estuaries or in, in the sea. <coughs> so... Most, I don't know, I, didn't, I forgot to ask the question, but I was going to ask the question, when you look at that graph, my first reaction would be, oh, that's fish then. It's, it's all about fish uh, and fish from the sea, but it's not. And when you drill into it, so there's about 80 million metric tonnes produced in aquaculture. Half of that is freshwater fish. Um, and then we've got um, algae, meaning seaweeds, and, and mollusks in, in marine aquaculture production. Um, diadromous fish here means mostly salmon, it's so salmon and trout. Uh, and then we have marine fish production is, 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 is pretty small. And if you, if you add up the, the bottom section, uh, it's only a few percent of total production. So <laughs> that's, I suppose, one message is it's not fish that are being grown. And it's certainly, uh, at least half of it, is nothing to do with the sea at all. It's, it's, it's terrestrial uh, aquatic uh, um, freshwater production. And the other question to say is, well, where is that taking place? Where does that um, fish farming happen? And 
Uh, as you can see from, this, from the same report, um, we've got, uh, I can't add it up, 80, 80 91 uh, million metric tonnes produced in China and the rest of Asia. China by far being the leading nation in terms of aquaculture production. And if we look at how the rest of the world is doing, well, I mean, in Europe, in, in the Americas, in Africa, very, very uh, low numbers. So, when we look back at that graph, which shows how aquaculture is replacing or complementing seafood supply from the oceans, actually, that might be true in China, but it's mostly taking place in freshwater ponds right across the country uh, inland, and these are mostly producing carps and, um, as the, as the main, main, main fish they're producing. And if you look at what's happening elsewhere, the rest of the world is no, by no means producing half of its um, seafood or aquatic food supply from, from, from aquaculture. Far, far less than that. So I suppose the message from that view of things is we've still got a long way to go or there's still plenty of potential in the more Pollyanna-ish view of things to, to keep, keep um, increasing food production. I and mean, we can have a look at, at, at the EU. I'm not going to go into a lot of EU statistics, so um, I'm happy still to put EU slides up for another six months or so. But if we've got EU production statistics, um, it's, it's, it sounds quite impressive. Uh, if you look at the figures, there's a range of species. About a third of it is, is freshwater. There are some marine species, we include the salmon um, being produced, and we've got bass and bream in the, in the Mediterranean, uh, quite a substantial amount of shellfish. Uh, and um, it doesn't look like a huge number compared to the previous slide, but still 1.3 million tonnes, very high value, over 3 billion's worth of products in euros, lots of jobs, lots of production systems. But actually, if you look at the text at the top, um, Nearly half of the seafood consumed in the EU is still imported. It's by no means self-sufficient in terms of seafood production. And this is really interesting. There has been no net increase in aquaculture production in the EU in the last 20 years. It's just been level. So the all that growth in production has been Asia, China and the rest of Asia. It really ha we haven't been seeing it, seeing it uh, in our own backyard. And we're no better in the UK. This is, a, this is a, an illustration from a recent report produced by Seafish, uh, Seafood 2020 forecasting report. And you can pick out the numbers here. Uh, actually, we do produce, in, this is in value rather than, than tonnage, but, but 800, uh, hmm, let's do it in billions, 0 0.8, 800 million uh, worth of products from aquaculture, which is larger than the UK landings from fisheries. But we're still importing much more than that, two and a half billion uh, pounds worth of uh, imported seafood. So there's still quite a long way to go to, to balance these things up. So, why is that? Well, okay, I'm, I'm going to pick on, I've talked, this, is, this divides, this figure here divides aquaculture production into different environments. And my environment, I've just got them as fully marine. Uh, over there, uh, fresh water at the top, and brackish water, meaning estuarine conditions in, in, over here. I think the two to look at are over on the, on the, on the left. So for freshwater aquaculture, as I suggested from the Chinese statistics, uh, that's mostly freshwater fish. Um, and if we look at the marine production, um, about 80% of it is, is mollusks, mostly bivalve shellfish, uh, and algae, meaning seaweeds. And then we've got the, um, the salmonids and then we've got the, the marine fish and a little bit of crustacean production. So again, it makes the point that when we look at the marine environment, let alone looking at geography, we're still not really talking about fin, fin fish production when we talk about aquaculture. And yet that is, is often uh, what we um, think about, or the concept that we have. 
so why is it not so, why are we not producing so much fish um, that's a big question to answer um, but there's a few clues I suppose um, and this going back to this figure there's another really interesting feature of this figure which is that um, if you follow the blue line or blue bar back to 1950 it's heading nearly to zero and if you went back a bit earlier than that it would probably shrink a bit more so the, the, the message from this is that this is a really new food production sector we're talking about all this growth to, to 80 or 90 million tonnes a year globally has taken place uh, in the last 60, 70 years. And you could compare that with terrestrial livestock production, where we have many thousands of years of the process of domestication, of selecting which species are the best ones to keep, and then breeding those, and we, we end up with the, with the farming systems we have at the moment, which are relatively, um, or, or lack diversity. There's relatively, you can get most of the species that are farmed terrestrially on, on one hand, or maybe a little bit going on to the second hand, if you want to list them. And during this time, in the 60, 70 years, there's this whole range of species in the marine environment that could potentially be farmed. Most of the selection in marine aquaculture has been driven more by f finances than by the idea of filling the f deficit in world food production. And it's worth remembering, aquaculture is not actually, um, it's not actually, uh, it's, it's, it's been done as businesses. If you drill down into it, it's a set of private enterprises producing seafood for profit. And they've largely, the fish producing ones, have focused on high value species. Uh, and there's an interesting analysis, which I don't totally agree with, but this, this is a good starting point. In picking marine species, fish species to, to farm, uh, if you compare terrestrial agriculture on the left side of the figure with um, marine aquaculture on the right, what do we, what do, we do uh, in... in um, uh, in terrestrial agriculture, well, a lot of our production is plants. So it's the first primary production, first level of production, first trophic level. We have the equivalent in the sea. We have phytoplankton, uh, we have macroalgae, the seaweeds, and as you've seen in the statistics, there's a lot of farming of seaweeds going on. That's a, that's a, that's a big production area. We might farm in, in terrestrial farming systems, the second trophic level, um, sheep and cows and goats um, and we might even push up a little bit into somewhere into the third trophic level if you include pigs which are omnivorous but we haven't even reached by the third trophic level fish which we consider to be um, relatively low on the food chain in the marine system so if you start when you by the time you're farming breams and salmons you're up past the equivalent of of third trophic level wolves and bears into these mythical wolf eaters and eaters of wolf eaters. So there's, um, so that, that potentially is a limitation um, because, and that's the argument of this paper by Carlos Duarte and his group, their argument is that this, this is a very inefficient form of food production. We're farming predators rather than herbivores. Uh, and therefore, uh, we're having to feed them high protein diets. Um, and that in itself is a net loss. I'll then point to the next couple of slides looking at the, the fact that we have to use fish meal, ground up fish to feed some of these fish. I would argue against that to some extent because the aquaculture industry has been, and, and the feed sector particularly, has been making great strides in terms of compressing this. So, um, uh, most farm fish are fed pelleted diets of some sort. This in a traditional marine species diet would contain a lot of fish meal made from, from uh, low trophic level fish, anchovies, uh, herring, which are, which are turned into, into fish meal and then and fish, oil, fish oil separated 
and those go sit partially into the, into the diet of the, of the farmed fish. So there is this element of we're taking aquatic production and using it to grow more expensive fish rather than growing new aquatic food production. Um, I think, sorry, I'm going to slip back up here, but actually aquaculture has now grown so much that demand for fish meal is, is pushing beyond a, a finite supply. There's only so many small fish in the sea you can harvest to make into fish meal. And so <coughs> alternatives are being adopted. That means using more plant protein sources in, uh, in, in fish feeds. It means using um, uh, more uh, vegetable oils to substitute some of the fish oil in fish feeds and, and reducing. So actually what's happening is you can take a salmon which in this model, in its natural environment, might be a fourth trophic level species, but actually you can get it down pretty close to somewhere about two and a half in a, in a trophic level analysis. So food technology has compressed this food chain. So that criticism isn't quite strong, but it, there is a lot of resource, food resource, still being put into farming high value species. That's not necessarily a bad thing, because if you were going to put high quality feed ingredients into any species, you should pick fish. Because what <coughs> fish are good at, sorry, this is an American slide, so it's in pounds rather than, um, uh, rather than uh, kilos. But what this is comparing is fish, chickens, pigs, and cattle. And it's the ratio between how much you have to feed them in order to get a pound of growth. Cattle, not very efficient, 6.8 pounds or kilos to get, to get one. Pigs, just under three. Chickens, pretty good, 1.7. Fish, somewhere about 1.1. And in salmon farming, they're getting down below that, about 0.9 of a kilo of feed to get a pound of body mass. This is, uh, tends to be dry feed to wet body mass. That's how you can get below one. But still, um, why are fish so efficient? Um, they have a couple of advantages. They, they are, they're cold-blooded, so they're not expending energy on maintaining uh, that aspect of their metabolism. They are neutrally buoyant in the medium they live in, they're swimming in water. Uh, and so their overall energetic costs are, are lower compared to animals that have to battle gravity and walk. Um, and they are physiologically very good at extracting um, nutrition from what they eat. So you end up with uh, this quite low food conversion ratio. So there is an argument, well, okay, feeding good quality food into fish is not great, but surely it's better than that, than the kind of um, feedlot cattle production we see in, uh, in some countries. So it's kind of a good story, good news, bad news story. There are also issues around particularly um, cage farming of um, fish in coastal waters, which is where most marine fish farming takes place at the moment. There's a whole section of, of, of talk we could give, of talking about specifically about these environmental impacts. So it's kind of captured in this one slide, and, and they range from the fact that um, if, you, if, if you've got fish in a cage and you feed them, the feed's coming in at the top. Of, a, of the nitrogen in the feed that you feed to the animals, about half of that's excreted. That ends up in either in the water, some of it ends up in the sediment below the cages. Um, there are issues around um, transfer of uh, diseases to wild stocks. Uh, the biggest thing uh, limiting salmon production in, in Europe at the moment is the rate of infestation with, with sea lice, so parasitic uh, sea lice. So there's a range of different environmental issues and, and these can limit, if you're, if you're looking to farm fish in relatively sheltered coastal waters like the sea lochs of Scotland, then the more fish you have in the water, the closer the farms are together, the greater most of these issues then become. They become cumulative. And so that can limit the amount of production you can get out of coastal waters. It's a very generalised point, but it, 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 I think it's, it's reasonably fair. Uh, and there are ways around that. So one approach has been to say, well, let's not farm fish on in the sea, let's farm them on land. And this is the idea of bringing fish indoors into um, systems with, where the water's recirculated and cleaned up in filters. Uh, and it has some great advantages. It really does in terms of fish production. You get great environmental stability. Uh, you don't have a winter. 
you have the right perfect temperature to support happy fish growing fast. And more to the point, you don't have oscillations in environmental conditions. You can keep the conditions very steady and that keeps the fish uh, less stressed and the growth performance is good. You don't have to be out in, in looking, you're not competing with for coastal space. Uh, you could capture some of the waste in the wastewater and the sludge that comes out of the biofilters. And you can avoid disease problems because you can have a biosecure facility. But it does have disadvantages, and uh, this, this is a very high investment cost to do this kind of, of farming. Uh, it's still an emerging technology, uh, and there are very few farms which currently are, are able to show this is, a, is a, a profitable business to get into. So the history has been very mixed. Lots of farms have been set up, many have folded. It's still an evolving sector. This still may prove to be a cost-effective way of growing fish. There is a biosecurity issue too. It's great, you can keep diseases out, but once you've got the disease inside a system like this, it can wipe out everything and you can have a, a disaster situation and then it might be very difficult to purge the whole system of that infection. So this is actually, this is, this is often promoted as the way forward in fish farming and I'm not discounting it. I think that is, there is potential. I think there's still quite a long way to go before it gets fully commercial in the sense of large scale food production. The other idea is, well, if the problem is that you're in constrained space in sheltered coastal waters, why don't you go offshore, go away from the coast into a more dispersive environment where the waste can be lost in the dilution of the, of the volume of water out there, uh, where you can have farms spaced far apart, you don't have the problems of disease transfer. Um, clearly, there are still some technical issues with this in terms of how do you put stuff offshore? How do you get out there? How do you maintain your fish? All those types of things are still questions, but this is, this is kind of the alternate strategy to increase fish production. But I suppose the message is no matter what you do in that approach, either, or sorry, either approach, whether you're in tanks or if you're in cages in the sea, you can't get away from the fact that you're in this kind of um, version of a feedlot model. You've got animals in high densities, a small space, you feed them a high quality food, and you turn something which, actually if you're thinking about human food production, we could probably eat that feed and survive quite well. We're, we're turning low cost food into high value fish, and that's, that's the process. That will get better, though it's, it's, a, it's an incremental innovation and technology development. Fish meal and fish oil usage is going down. Um, new species are being uh, tried out. Um, more to the point, species have been domesticated, so instead of going to the natural gene pool, we've got species, uh, lines of families which have been adapted over selective breeding over many generations to be more suited to uh, the conditions in these kind of intensive farming systems. So this is, this is, um, this is, a, this is a model that has potential to produce high value fish. The question is, is it really adding to net food production? And this is, I found this paper, this I'll put it in the title of the talk, or the, the bit of text that went with the talk. Um, this is a nice study, I felt like the fact that it was a PhD student at the University of California in Santa Barbara who put it out. Uh, and she found from her analysis that there were potentially 11 uh, uh, square kilometers of, of ocean space that might be suitable for offshore aquaculture production. Which could, well, if you use 0.015% of it, you could um, equal our current global fisheries landings. And if you used all of it, in theory, you could produce 15 billion tons of fish. It's a lot of fish. But I go back to the previous slides. What are you going to feed them? How are you going to service these offshore sites? There, a, there, are, there are some very significant issues that would undermine uh, web. And, and interestingly, this, and this is kind of a given, we're talking about fin fish, which isn't the main. Uh, species that are actually being produced in aquaculture anyway, and they're being looked at as the potential for growth. There is another way of looking at, at aquaculture. If you start looking at the potential for uh, true, uh, truly for food production, um, and there's a really nice report if you want to find it um, called Food from the Oceans. It's produced by uh, an advisory group to the EU. Uh, it's called uh, 
surprisingly, that's the Sapir report. That's a oh, if you send that as a link. They were looking at this whole issue of, of the potential for um, both fisheries and aquaculture to support uh, aquatic food supplies into the future. Lots of text here, um, but two things they come up with is um, we should be moving to lower trophic levels, both in fisheries and in aquaculture farming. Uh, and that, if you look at it globally, it's herbivore filter feeders, like bivalve mollusks, and cultivated algae or seaweeds that really are the ones that offer the, op offer, offer the opportunity to secure um, seafood production into the future. Which gives rise to this idea of more environmentally integrated aquaculture. So this is kind of diametrically opposite to the idea of bringing fish into buildings and tanks indoors. Because if you're going to, whether you're farming seaweeds, or whether you're farming shellfish, you really depend on high quality environment to do that. So it really depends on environmental integrity. Um, it's generally a, a relatively low impact activity. There aren't so many of the issues in terms of the byproducts of feed, um, not so much the disease transfer as yet because of the scale that, that the production's on. Um, and it truly is net food production. This is genuinely, there's no feed input, but there's food coming out. Um, and um, provides a range of ecosystem services, which I'll go into in the next few slides, and for the benefit of David and the other end, it has a low carbon footprint relative to uh, feed-based agriculture. It's interesting, on the side, if you look at a, a life cycle assessment of feed-based agriculture, nearly all the carbon footprint comes from the feed, not the production or the farming itself. So in this type of agriculture, uh, that gets missed out. So this is this is this is the idea of the farming seaweeds, and I'm, I'm I'm coming here as a representative of the Shellfish Centre. So you appreciate I'm going to talk about shellfish, but uh, let's give seaweed a nod. There's actually 27 million tons of of, of seaweeds being grown. Uh, these are mostly uh, kelps being produced in China, in Japan, uh, and Korea. Um, and uh, tropical uh, algae being produced around the Indo-Pacific in, in pretty low-tech farms. So it can be done. It's again not been done so much in, in uh, outside of Asia. And shellfish production is always already pretty respectable at 16 million tons. So so it's a little diversion from global to local. So it's worth remembering, so from a North Wales perspective, that we have um, on our doorstep in the eastern end of the Menai Strait, we have um, one of the UK's largest shellfish production areas. Now some people will know that, not everybody knows that, so it's worth mentioning. It's based um, just between uh, Bangor Pier and up towards uh, Bermaris. There are a series of uh, areas within the um, Several order, which is where the shellfish beds are, and this is mussel fishery, uh, can produce, uh, it varies from year to year, somewhere between four to 12,000 tonnes of mussels a year. In a good year, this represents half of mussel production for the UK. So that's a pretty significant operation mm -hmm. that some people might not know about. Um, that's what it looks like at low tide. Uh, the mussels are grown by being laid in the intertidal mudflats. Uh, and then um, they're, they, they're, they're grown there for a, a period of time, once two years, uh, before being dredged for harvest. So if you went low water, it looks a bit like a, a ploughed field. It's a well-worked bit of intertidal ground. And the seeds, the baby mussels that supply that, uh, uh, are dredged from natural recruitment of baby mussels in various points around the RSC, and then they're aggregated into that production area. So there's no hatchery, it's all based on natural production. There is some move away from that. Uh, the biggest area, area, area of uh, muscle production is actually in, in Holland. Um, and there they have moved completely away from fishing the baby mussels from the seabed. Uh, they put up nets uh, on, on the penny underneath these floating uh, booms. Uh, and there's natural recruitment of settled uh, larvae onto those and then those 
young mussels are harvested and laid on the seabed for that uh, sea bottom uh, production. And that's something that we've been trialling here in, uh, in North Wales. So um, in this chart here, that's Puffin Island. This is the corner of Anglesey. We're um, about here. Now, uh, this little mark on the chart, you can't make out probably, is that we have a small test area for uh, rope production of mussels. And what we've been doing is putting out these ropes to test for the potential for collecting seed on settling on ropes rather than dredging them. And this would make the whole production uh, more reliable and, and more sustainable. Uh, and this, this is actually proving to be really, it works. You can, you can gather a lot of muscles this way. We're still working on the, the kind of technological aspects of it and of course the economics of whether it's um, cost effective to do it. But it's really quite interesting. This could, this could really uh, help uh, that, that production between 4,000 tonnes and 12,000 tonnes largely depends on how many seed they've been able to find to put in at the beginning of the production system. This could stabilise that and have a much more reliable uh, supply. So the advantages, this, the reason I put that example of, it's a, it's, it's a very sustainable production. It's, it's accredited by the Marine Stewardship Council. It was one of the first accredited enhanced fisheries globally, or the first one. And I put this up because it's an example that shellfish farming can be quite a low-impact low activity. If you were producing 12,000 tonnes of salmon in cages in the eastern end of the Menai Strait, uh, the impacts would be greater than this. Um, it, it is an activity that is compatible with conservation designations. Let's not forget that that part of the uh, bit of coast falls within the Menai Strait SAC. It falls within the SBA, the North Wales SBA. Uh, it's heading up towards, uh, it's included in the, in the um, Harbour Porpoise um, SAC. So it, it's, it's, the activity is compatible with all of those conservation designations, which is a really important point. But that has been built on a lot of evidence, which requires collaboration between scientists and industry, and that's part of the reason why the Shellfish Centre has evolved uh, to exist today, is based on that history of collaboration. Another issue, which we'll come back to, is, is that to grow this sector, um, there is a precautionary approach. If there's, if there's not enough evidence, the regulating authorities, the people who have to make the decision about consent for new production areas, they have to take a precautionary approach. So there's, there's, there, there's a, there can be a bit of a roadblock between someone wanting to set up a new farm area and actually being able to get permission to do that until they have enough evidence to show that there won't be some uh, effect on the conservation features of whichever area it's being produced in. So, I mentioned ecosystem services, and I'm, I'm going to give a quick, quick um, run through. This is kind of interesting for, for why shellfish are a good thing. It's a good argument for why shellfish are a good thing. The first uh, asset, if you look at ecosystem services, they can be broken down into various categories. And the first one to consider is provisioning services. This is what do we actually get as humans from, from, from this uh, uh, system. And what we get from this is uh, we get food, um, and we are getting low trophic level food, and we have no feed input. So we, it's a very, very good uh, um, uh, source of provisioning services. Another example of ecosystem system services, um, regulating services is how, does, how, how, are, uh, how is environmental quality and um, they're regulated within, within a particular ecosystem. Uh, and shellfish have a really important ecosystem function here as filter feeders. Uh, they'll remove particulate material, including um, phytoplankton from the water column. Um, and so uh, they can uh, remove, and then that particular material contains nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus particularly, which can be removed from the water. So there have been a range of studies looking at the mussel beds in Bangor, uh, and there have been studies elsewhere. Uh, but a hectare of mussels, based on this Spangler study, can filter uh, uh, 30,000 metre cubes of water a day, um, and that can equate up to about a tonne of nitrogen removed from the water column a year. And it's estimated globally that farmed bivalves remove about 49,000 tonnes of nitrogen and 6,000 tonnes of phosphorus. How do we value this? And how, well, there are examples of how you can value it. Uh, there's quite a nice uh, example in, in Sweden where uh, uh, a town has a problem with excessive nitrogen discharge from its sewage treatment work. Um, and the, the, the one solution was to build a very expensive 
tertiary um, sewage treatment plant. The alternative was to pay somebody to farm some mussels. And so by farming the mussels, um, 3,500 tonnes in coastal waters nearby, there's no guarantee it's the same nutrients coming out of the outfall pipe that are going into the mussels, but the equivalent to 100% removal and offset of that nitrogen discharge was achieved. Now this is, this is an interesting example because you can't, this is in a relatively polluted waters, these were not for human consumption, but they were then recycled back into animal feed. So it does seem, this is quite an interesting example of like carbon trading and nutrient trading, and, and there is a, a lot of potential, this is something we're looking at for a range of different sites uh, around the UK and uh, abroad at the moment. Other ecosystem services, um, provision of habitat and feed for other important species. Um, there's some nice studies from Menai Strait showing that, that um, wading birds uh, can get a good um, bonus in terms of food supply from the mussel beds. Um, there are very there are many more studies actually in, in the US on oyster beds which show that they support a lot of biodiversity, they support fisheries, and those fisheries in turn um, actually support uh, human food consumption as well. So there's a, there's a, there's a biodiversity support from, from shellfish beds. Um, and there's less tangible things. Cultural services come under ecosystem services. It's quite interesting to see what those might include. Um, there are many traditional examples of, of seafood or oyster festivals around the world. Well, actually, these are all in the UK. This is, this is uh, the Colchester Oyster Feast from uh, the 19... Uh, just after the First World War, I think, 1920 or so. Um, so there's, there's kind of this whole aspect of the, the value of seafood in, in coastal cultures, the people that work in the sector, and the, the um, importance of seafood and shellfish within, within rural coastal communities. Um, and we can look at art and architecture. Uh, there's some nice examples, seeing as where we are in an art gallery. So, this is an example on the left from uh, La Troya in Spain, which is a, um, a church you can't see in the detail. It's entirely clad in oyster shells. So that's uh, uh, one nice example in architecture. Closer to home in Conway, it's the mussel sculpture. So a famous mussel, mussel fishing town. Um, we can go further afield, so it'll be a bit global. Go out to the Middle East, where they're very keen on pearl oysters. Uh, this is in Doha and Qatar. We have public art with uh, oyster shells. Public buildings, this is a museum in the shape of an oyster shell, and large scale coastal developments. This is from Google Earth. This is a, one of those artificial islands that's been built, and these are meant to be pearl oysters, and here's the pearl, pearls out on the thread on the side. So it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's um, shellfish inspiring art and architecture. So that's kind of a in, very indirect and not quantifiable uh, ecosystem service. You can pick on some of them, and you can actually value them. Uh, and the most important ones in terms of contribution to, to the sort of economic value of ecosystem services are the, are the nutrient reduction uh, and the use of oyster shells as aggregate in various building uses. Uh, this is a, a recent review done by a PhD student, Andy, uh, Andy Chat Olivier. Um, it's just coming out now. Uh, he did a global analysis and, and it came out that somewhere between 3 to 10 billion US dollars worth of additional services over and above the food value were generated by farming shellfish. So if we double shellfish production, we get this uh, bonus on top of that, as well as the food that's being produced. So I talked a bit about the limitation on, on fish production, even though there's lots of space, various reasons for that. It's a pretty sad story, actually, when we look at shellfish production. So this is shellfish production in the EU uh, since 1950. And I showed you that inspiring growth of aquaculture globally. And actually, um, here we go. So, shellfish make up half of the EU's aquaculture production, if you look at the statistics. Creates a lot of jobs. There has been no increase in shellfish production in EU waters in 30 years. None. It goes up and down, but it stays within the, in the range. So, the green line at the top is adding all together. We've got mussels and oysters down here. So uh, there was a real boom, and then it's really tailed off in terms of growth. So it's interesting, so, that, that's, so why is that not happening? What could we do? This is, again, thinking more locally, but that could, that could maybe change that. 
certainly in EU coastal waters, access to sites to produce shellfish is limited. And sites means space, basically. It's a, it's a complex uh, coastal environment we, we would have to work <coughs> with. Um, and the combination of the limited number of space, competing uses, um, the potential uh, environmental and, and societal interactions of setting up a new farm I mean, the process of approving a new farm can take a really long time. So this is an EU site that says it can take up to seven years. Well, we know there are examples in, in, in the coast of Wales which have been over ten years and still haven't managed to get approval. So there's a, there's a, um, it's a challenging um, situation for somebody who might want to, to increase uh, shellfish production. And let's bear in mind, from a Welsh point of view, the Welsh Government has had an ambition to, to double shellfish production. Um, and yet this remained fairly static. So not, not in, out of line with anywhere else, and largely it's to do with the difficulty in finding space to do it in. And that's fair enough. China has fantastic shellfish production statistics. If you go and look at where they're producing shellfish, these are oyster trestles in Mulan Bay, it can look like this. Now I don't think we'll be doing this in the Welsh coast, uh, but it gives you an idea of the, of the kind of um, top-down planning approach that's focused on food production in a communist country, what kind of space use they can facilitate in order to achieve, that, to achieve food production. And that's what you're seeing here. Um, that's, you might say, oh, that's never, you know, but actually if you look at a large oyster farm, this is an oyster farm in, in Jersey, they do require a lot of space. They're trestles in the intertidal, um, and there's, there's, they, they, they may have a relatively um, low level of environmental impact, um, care being taken to use non-reproductive triploid oysters, not the ones that the Pacific oysters that might breed, uh, and colonise areas of the coast, but you can still see how to get permission for this through might be, be challenging for that kind of permanent, semi-permanent use of uh, an area of the, of the foreshore. So, that, so then, so, well okay, maybe shellfish can go Offshore, maybe, shore, maybe offshore is a good idea. And this is what other countries have been doing. So we can go to Australia and New Zealand, and they've really been pioneering this idea, particularly for mussel production, of going offshore to fairly, not quite fully exposed conditions, but fairly exposed conditions. Uh, and this is the type of system they're using. They've got a long line below the surface and surface of water at the top there. Uh, and then they're hanging lines, single or continuous lines. This is very much like the system I just showed you where we were collecting seed mussels off, off um, Papua Island. And this works really well. This is what the New Zealand mussel industry, which is really successful, is basing most of its production on now. And there are some pioneers in the UK. There's an outfit called Offshore Shellfish down in Lime Bay who've, who've started doing this on a large scale. They've got about 10,000 tonnes of mussels on ropes at the moment, getting ready to harvest. So it, it can work. Um, and potentially, this is something that if we look at Welsh waters, maybe it's, maybe it's possible to do something like this here. Bearing in mind that even if you go offshore, you're not going to get China-level statistics unless you're prepared to do this. This is, this is Sungo Bay, which is a really famous aquaculture. So this isn't actually shellfish. It's shellfish and seaweed. Most of these floats on, on kelp production lines. They have fantastic kelp production. They've got shellfish interspersed with that. But if you get on a boat, if this doesn't do justice to the scale, and you try and get across this, it takes you several hours to get from one side to the other. And in a relatively uh, exposed bay in the Welsh coast, I'm not sure if you could get away with that. So, but that, that's not the scale of production that's needed. We, that doesn't need to be like this. If you want to double shellfish production in coastal waters in Wales, and you went for this type of system, you could do it in a few hundred hectares, which is actually a relatively small body of water, and it could be quite a long way offshore. Which is kind of where, I guess I'm getting near the end of, end of the talk here, is, is to think about, well, how do you achieve that? It's, so there are technical issues, and there are technical issues around how you do this offshore and whether it's possible, but it largely comes down to, to a marine planning question as well. This is the kind of societal question, is, how much is that potential food, food production valued alongside all the other perfectly valid uses of marine space? 
uh, we can look out of the, well not from here, but if you're on the, other, on, the, on the east shore, you can look out across to the wind farms. Uh, that's clearly a use of marine space. Um, we've got uh, fishing, fisheries, navigation. Um, uh, we've got tourism. Uh, we've got the, the um, recreational boating community. They're all perfectly valid uses of marine space. So somehow you have to find a way of finding um, compatible use. And that's um, and also uh, on top of that, these are conservation EU conservation designations, European marine sites, uh, and, SAS, and SPAs around the Welsh coast. Uh, and if you add them up, it's something like forty-five percent of the Welsh coastline has some form of protection. So there you run into the obstacle of having to demonstrate that any new shellfish production would be compatible with uh, those, those designations. doesn't mean it's impossible. We have examples to show that can be done. Most uh, SACs are established to um, support socio-economic activity, not just purely conservation. So it's finding that balance between the protection of the designated features and uh, whatever that socio-economic activity might be. Which is where the idea of marine planning comes in. So this is what the, 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 all the um, devolved governments in the UK are in the process of doing, is developing uh, marine plans. And the idea is, it's like a, if you think of it as like a layered system, where you look at all the potential um, uses of space around the coast, and you have to analyse where those could take place, where they do take place, where they could take place. You can layer them on top of each other, looking for areas of potential conflict, and perhaps also finding areas for opportunity where there might be um, space for use by one of those sectors that doesn't impinge on the other so much. So that's kind of the process that's taking place. It's, in, it's happening at the moment. It's, it's not, uh, not there yet. Um, and it's be interesting to see how that, that works out. Um, all we can do as scientists is try and contribute evidence to that. That's our, that's our job in, in, in research. Uh, and we have another project as well as the Shelfish Centre that's going to run, run alongside it from the European Maritime Fisheries Fund, it's just been awarded, to look at the potential for offshore shellfish production around, around uh, the Welsh coast. Um, and there's a whole range of things, that are fundamental studies that have to be done, looking at um, sort of some of its production trials. Is it technically possible under the quite harsh conditions in terms of wave climate and currents we have around the Welsh coast? What about water quality? I haven't even touched on that for shellfish production, that's another whole, whole topic. Uh, what's the carrying capacity? Um, you know, how much shellfish can you produce without having a negative impact? Hydrodynamic modelling, what are the currents and wave climates? What, um, what's the seabed type? There's a whole lot of um, research needs to be done, but that can all feed into at least identifying areas that have some potential uh, that can move into, the, into, move into that marine planning uh, dialogue. So that's, that's where we are at the moment, that's just starting, and that will go on for three years as well. So, last slide, I promise you. Um, this is, this is, this is uh, UK aquaculture production statistics since 1980. This is, this is oysters and shellfish, and uh, mussels, but it's mostly mussels. The blue line, it's salmon on the green line. Um, and I put this up because when, I, when we got the Shellfish Centre project awarded, I had to do a TV interview, and the reporter asked a really good question. He said, so is... is Shellfish production going to be for Wales what salmon production is for Scotland? Well, I think looking at this graph, uh, we'd have to increase shellfish production by a factor of 10 to achieve that. And I suspect that's uh, pretty unlikely, seeing as the most ambitious targets we have at the moment are about to double it. However, it's not unreasonable to hope that we can achieve some growth and to uh, establish what is... is for the most part, a very sustainable, low-impact form of food production uh, into some more areas around the Welsh coast to try and uh, increase production. I don't think that we'll be seeing 180,000 tonnes of mussels being grown on offshore ropes around the Welsh coast uh, anywhere in the near future, but if it could be uh, 10,000, that would be great. Okay, I will close there. Uh, thanks very much for listening.